So the average person spends about 151 minutes per day on websites or apps such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. 151 minutes. Think about that. Well over two hours, two and a half hours a day scrolling through websites. And I am absolutely convinced that, that many of those minutes on social media are spent while waiting for someone or waiting for something. It never fails, right? You go to the doctor's office and you're sitting in the waiting room, and as you're sitting in the waiting room, you look around and what's everybody doing? They got their phones out and they're scrolling, right? You go to dinner and you order your food and you're waiting for your food to come and you look around and what do you see? On a table of four or five people, every head is down and they're scrolling their phones. They, they have a routine. It's like, okay, while I'm waiting, I'm going to do this thing. And most of us have some sort of a go-to action while we're waiting for something. Maybe it is social media. Maybe it's sending emails. Maybe it's uh, making notes about what you need to do for the next day. Maybe some of you, when you know that you're going to be waiting somewhere, you read a book and, uh, or you, you bring something else to kind of keep your mind preoccupied. Some of you don't do social media. Some of you are like candy crush people, right? And so while you're waiting, you're just crushing it uh, with video games. That's the way it works, right? I'll never forget. We were down at an amusement park not long ago. And uh, while we're waiting in line, I look down through the line. Nobody is looking up. No one is looking around. Everybody is doing this. I'm like, what are they doing? But it's what we do. Well, last week, we saw that James called believers to be patient as we await the coming of the Lord Jesus. And during that time, while we're waiting, many of us experience suffering of some kind along the way. But what are we supposed to do while we're patiently waiting? Well, the answer is found for us in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. So if you would, take your copy of God's Word, find James chapter 5, and we will look this morning to find the answer to this question. While we wait, what are we to do? Well, the answer is simple. We are to pray and we are to keep on praying. So look with me, if you would, verse number 13, in James chapter 5, God's word says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, conf confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Father, I pray now as we come before you and look at your word, God, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for what it teaches us. God, I pray that our minds and hearts would be open and receptive to what you are going to teach us this morning about prayer and the necessity of prayer in our lives. God, I pray that we would respond rightly to it, that the Holy Spirit inside of us, that he would open our eyes so that we might see your word as truth, that we might acknowledge it as truth, and Father, that we might follow it as truth. So Lord, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the opportunity we have this morning to learn from it. We ask you to guide and direct in all things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So God responds to the prayers of his people. This is a text that is a little complex. It's a text that is probably one of the most misunderstood passages in the entire book of James. Now, James lends itself to some confusion. His writing lends itself to confusion. Of course, many people are confused in chapter 2 when it talks about uh, faith and works, and people have been confused about other sections as they have worked through James over the past two millennia. But this particular section lends itself to a lot of false ideology, a lot of false teaching, a lot of misunderstanding about the topic at hand. However, we, we must not lose sight of the fact that this text is clearly about the necessity of prayer. 
So when we pull back a little ways and we, and we look at it from a, a little bit higher angle, we'll see that the word pray or prayer or praying is found in every single verse in this text. It's found in 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. And so when you have a word that is repeated over and over again in a specific text, then you know just from a, a study principle that there is something important that we are to grab about that specific topic. And the topic is quite clearly prayer. And it is the prayer of God's people specifically. And so we take a step back, we look carefully, we see something that James wanted his readers to pray because as Calvin wrote, there is no time in which God does not invite us to himself. There is not a time where God does not invite us to himself. Think about that for a moment. It's really astounding that the God of all creation, that the God of the universe, majestic in power, uh, un unmatched in glory and splendor, he wants us to come to him and pray. He wants us to spend time with him. That is not a small thing, is it? Think about it. it it's, un un it's amazing is what it is. It's unimaginable that God would want to spend time, that God would want me to approach him. And then in this text, really, the opening verse of this text, it communicates to us that God wants us to pray, that God wants us to approach him at our lowest of lows and in the highest of highs, that there is not a time in our life in which God does not invite us into himself. The lows, the highs, every point in between. And what we see from James is this, that God responds to the prayers of his people. This is not the first time that James calls on believers to pray. If we go back to chapter 1, verse number 5, James says this, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, and who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. So at the outset of this letter, he tells his readers, listen, if you're lacking wisdom, here's what you do. You pray to God. And in prayer to God, he will give it to you. James reflects really the teaching first and foremost of Jesus. Back in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, there's a section there in chapter 6 where Jesus is teaching on prayer, and he prefaces his teaching on prayer, which we know as the Lord's Prayer or the Model Prayer. He prefaces his teaching on prayer with these words, when you pray. Not if you pray, but when you pray. And so the understanding that Jesus was communicating was that you as my disciples are going to pray. It's going to be part of your life. It's going to be the habit, the direction, the flow of your life as a disciple, as a follower of Christ, that you will pray. Later on in chapter 7, Jesus addresses prayer again, and he says this, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. So Jesus says this, you, you ask, and you keep on asking. You seek, and you keep on seeking. You knock, and it, you keep on knocking, and you do so through prayer. We come forward to Paul's teaching in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and Paul communicates this to those believers, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, that there should never be a time, a moment in our lives in which we are not in active conversation and communion with God through prayer, that it is the default position of the life of a believer, that we are a praying people. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul tells those believers, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Over and over and over again throughout the New Testament, we have this message that God's people are to pray. And the believers that James addressed likely struggled with prayer the same way that we struggle with prayer. I don't think there's probably any or very few in this audience who would argue against the idea that believers' lives should be marked by prayer. I think if I was to take a, a snap poll of the audience and say, do you believe that a follower of Christ should always be praying? I, I would venture to say that, that that 
response would be an overwhelming yes. If I were to ask you uh, in a snap poll, do you believe that prayer is important and vital in the life of a believer? My thought is that that response would come by, back with an overwhelming yes. But yet here we are, James is addressing a group of believers in a specific church. We don't know what church, but we know he's addressing a group of believers in a church, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And he's telling them, you must pray. And that leads me to think something. That leads me to think that these people weren't so much different than we are in the fact that we know that we ought to be praying and we know that prayer is extremely vital to our life spiritually, but yet we struggle in prayer. Why do we struggle with it? Well, I I think there's a few reasons. First of all, I think that we view prayer as really nothing more than a spiritual discipline. That it is something that we need to accomplish so that we can check the box each day. So as we get up in the morning, we think about all the, the good things that Christians are supposed to do. We, okay, read the Bible, check. Uh, pray, check. Tell others about Jesus, check. Uh, give, check. Right? On Sundays, go to church, check. On Wednesdays, go to Bible study, check. Right? Yeah? No, okay. Okay. Um, And we, when we think of prayer in those terms, that it's, it's just a discipline that I, I need to do. But how often do you consider prayer vital to your spiritual life and treat it as such? How often do you think of prayer as necessary for your spiritual well-being as you think of food for your physical well-being? How often do you think of prayer as necessary for your spiritual well-being as you think of sleep for your physical well-being? We typically don't think of prayer in those terms. But yet, what is prayer? Prayer is expressing our trust in God and acknowledging that He is fully sufficient to meet any and every need that we have. But when we struggle with prayer, there's something else going on here. Not only do we have the wrong view of it, it's a a discipline that is good to do, but not necessarily vital for our spiritual well-being. But then there's another side to that as well, and this is a little darker. And that we declare when we refuse to pray that we don't believe that we need God. See, when we don't pray, we are making a declaration. We're saying something with our life that we would never imagine saying with our mouth. And the declaration we make when we don't pray is this. God, I am wise, and I am strong, and I am good, and I am resourceful enough to meet my own needs, and I don't need you. Like I said, we would never say it with our mouth. But when we don't pray, we are declaring it with our life. And yet throughout the Bible, we see the call to believers to pray. We see the example of Jesus as he prayed. Listen, Jesus knew that it was necessary to pray. Jesus, the Son of God, right? And if Jesus knew that it was necessary to pray, if he knew that he had to spend time communing in prayer with the Father every single day, how much more do you and I need prayer? Vastly more. Significantly more. So we're going to walk through this text together this morning. It's a, it's a challenging text. It's, it is complex. Um, I, I'm not going to necessarily get into the deepest weeds with you. Uh, I, I'm going to point some things out as, along the way and show you some, some difficulties and some misunderstandings that some people get about this text. But, but really what I hope to do today is to show you the importance of prayer no matter what you're going through in life. And so my prayer for you 
as I've been studying this and preparing this, is that you will, as a result of hearing this and believing it, turn to God and trust him fully with every single need that you have. And so as we patiently wait, going back to chapter 5, verse number 7, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. As we patiently wait here on earth for the coming of the Lord, we must pray. Why? Because God responds to the prayers of his people. But that leads to another question. Why does God respond to the prayers of his people? Let me bring two answers out from the text this morning. First of all, that God desires to display his great compassion. Why does God respond to the prayers of his people? Because God desires to respond or display his great compassion. Compassion. Now, you might look at that heading and you might think, where in the world in this text do you see any idea of great compassion? Well, it's all through there. And by the time we work our way through this section, I, I hope that you'll see it with me. But, but to start out, you need to remember that James was addressing people who were suffering as disciples of Jesus. That's why he, he leads with this question. Is any among you suffering? Well, the question is rhetorical in nature. Evidently, James understood, knew that these people were suffering. He's addressed suffering from a Christian perspective all the way through this book. And the, the word used here has the idea of, a, of a, a mental or emotional distress or mental or emotional pain. It can mean physical, but most often it does not when this particular word is used. And so he says, is any among you suffering? Well, what kind of suffering would he be talking about? Well, if you look back at chapter 5, verse number 10, you see him uh, use that word really for the first time in this section as an example of suffering and patience, brothers. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. So he's like, okay, the prophets who preached the gospel, they suffered in this life. They suffered physically. They suffered emotionally. They, they suffered mentally. They suffered. They were distressed because of the ministry that God had given them to fulfill. But if we think back through the, the entirety of this letter, then we come across many different types of suffering that James has addressed to these believers. First of all, in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, he talks about the, the fact that we will suffer trials of various kinds. That is, followers of Jesus Christ, we are going to be confronted with many different kinds of trials, many different kinds of temptations, many different kinds of suffering suffering. And then he moves over to chapter 2 and he talks about the sin of partiality. And the idea there is that there are some who have suffered under the hand of those who treat people with partiality. In other words, people come into the church and they've got money and it's clear that they have money and they get the best seats while those who don't have that kind of wealth and that kind, uh, those kinds of resources are kind of pushed aside and, and shoved to the back. And then in chapter 3, he talks about those who have suffered at the hands of those who have blasphemed them and, and used their tongue against them and tore them down with their speech. And in chapter 3 also, he talks about those who are jealous, those who are, are driven by selfish ambition and the chaos and strife that engenders within the church and within society as a whole. He talks about judgment, unrighteous judgment in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, and, and suffering under the judgment of those who believe that their way, that their opinion, that their preference is the way everything ought to be and the way that everybody ought to behave, and therefore they are cast aside. We see that also in Romans chapter 14 and Romans 15. In chapter 5, we see that there were those who suffered uh, oppression at the hands of rich people who defrauded them. They would go out into the fields and they would work and they would expect to be paid at the end of the day for their work, but they would not be, receive uh, any type of financial remuneration. And, and so therefore they were defrauded by others and they, they were suffering financially and even in other ways from that. And then in verses 10 through 11, we see the suffering for, for the gospel, the suffering for the preaching of the gospel that the prophets had gone through and now these believers also were suffering and, and had to show patience as they were waiting on the Lord. And so he's saying, is, is there anyone among you who is suffering in any way? How do you respond to that? You don't back into a corner. You don't isolate yourself. You don't have a pity party. No, what does he say? Let him pray. 
It's in the middle voice, meaning this, that, that it's not somebody else praying for you, but it is you going to God in prayer, and that it is you going to God continually as a, as a force of habit. I'm suffering, and I'm going through a hard time, and, and what am I going to do about it? The very first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go to God, and I'm going to unload this burden on Him. Why? Because He says that I can cast all my cares upon Him because He cares for me. James is saying, you pray. So often, though, how... Do we do that? When someone wrongs us, someone says something about us that's not true, someone does something against us that that hurts us, wounds us, and causes a, a deep and lasting scar, is our first inclination then to go to God? Or is our first inclination to try to figure out how we can get them back? You hurt me, I'm gonna hurt you. You made me suffer, I'm going to make you suffer. You're going to pay for what you've done to me. I'm not saying that that we shouldn't cry out for justice where legitimate wrongs have taken place. Absolutely, we ought to. But James says this, the very first thing that you must do and the thing that you must consistently do as a follower of Christ when you're suffering is to what? Pray. Pray. Share it with God. Then he goes to the other end of the spectrum. Is anyone cheerful? The word here means encouraged. The idea is is one who is well sold. Think of the song, It is Well with My Soul. Yeah, things may not be perfect in your life, but, but your soul is in a good place. It's contented and it's joyful in Christ. And he says, What do you do? You sing praise. You lift up your voice to God, this time not in a prayer of maybe supplicating, but in just a prayer of praise to God. James is establishing from the lowest of the lows to the highest of the highs, this is the position of the believer. We go to God in everything. And throughout this letter, he addressed many different types of suffering that we experience. The answer James provided to believing church members who were suffering was to go to God. Look at verse 14. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Now the word sick here is different. The original word is sick or different from suffering. The word here has the idea of a, of a debilitating illness. It, it can mean, and sometimes it's used to refer to being spiritually sick or, or, or being spiritually um, distraught, but most of the times it's used, it's used in reference to a physical ailment or a physical illness. And so he's talking here about one who is physically ill. And so his instruction for that person is let him call for the elders of the church. Now there's a couple things here that I just need to point out to you. Okay. First of all, it is implied in the text that the person who is sick is in the church. And in the church doesn't mean in the context in the big C church, meaning a follower of Jesus Christ. In the context, because James was writing to a specific group of people, he's writing to somebody who is in the church, a local church, meaning I believe he's talking to one who has committed himself or herself to a local church in membership. That they have, they have committed themselves to a body and they are in the church. And because they are in the church and they have committed themselves to a body, they have also then placed themselves under the shepherding of the elders of that church. He he doesn't say call for any kind of elder. No, he says call for the elders of the church, that specific church to which you belong. 
So the implication is there's a person who is sick who is a member of the church. And that person who is sick and is a member of the church then has to call out to the elders who who have been tasked with shepherding that person, watching out for the spiritual good of that person, watching out even for the, the physical needs of that person, and then those elders are then responsible for responding to that person. So let me just say this. If you are a member of Cross Point Church, then you have placed yourself in a covenant community with a group of people here. You are in this church. And you have placed yourself under the ministries of the elders that God has given to this church, myself, Pastor Ben, and Pastor Nate. We have a very clear responsibility to care for you. We have a clear responsibility to care for you spiritually. We have a clear responsibility to care for you in every way that we can possibly care for you. If you are not a member of a local church and you get sick, you have no elders to call because you have not placed yourself under their ministry. You have not placed yourself under their spiritual headship. You have not placed yourself under their shepherding. They are not responsible for you. Now, as an elder, as a pastor, a shepherd, I, with joy, take responsibility for those whom God places under our ministry. It's a joy. It's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to care for the members of this church. But Scripture nowhere compels me to provide spiritual care for those who will not submit themselves to the spiritual leadership of the elders of this church. I will answer for the leadership that I provide. Pastor Ben, Pastor Nate will answer for the leadership that they provide of the members of this church, but none of us are going to answer for those who are not members. And I'm okay with that. Why? Because that's the way God designed it. So if, if you're attending Crosspoint and you're just like, you know what, I'm not going to join, then please understand that you have placed yourself on an island. You've isolated yourself really from the body. Yeah, you come every week and you sit among the people and you receive some of the spiritual benefit of the church through the teaching and preaching and ministries that are offered. But you cannot and you will not receive the full benefit that comes for those who have placed themselves into this covenant relationship under the leading of God of the local church. So James says, if there is one who is sick, physically ill, let him call for the elders of the church. And what will they do? Let them pray over him. There's something else you need to see here. James does not put the burden on the elders of the church for finding out what's wrong with the sick person. He puts the burden on the member to call the elders. You know why? Because we can't read people's minds. And, and we typically don't like to pry. And so the only way we know that somebody is sick is if they let us know they're sick. The only way we know to pray over somebody is to be told, hey, I need somebody to come and pray with me. Now, what that means for the average church member is that there are times where you just got to let go of your pride. There are times where you just have to let go of, of, of your stubbornness and say, no, I don't need anybody, I don't need anybody, and you have to realize, no, 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 God has placed me into this body because he wants others to come and, and pray for me and pray over me in my time of need, and so I, I'm going to call out to them, and then they are responsible to come, and they are responsible then to pray. James says, anointing him with oil. There's confusion over this phrase, 
Some people believe that it's the idea of a medicinal purpose, like you rub olive oil into dry skin um, and and it rejuvenates and reinvigorates the skin. Others say that this is simply a a, a symbolic consecration whereby uh, you're placing oil on on somebody and it it, uh, symbolically consecrates them to the work of the Holy Spirit to to do his work in their life in a physical way. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where that one lands. And I know this, that there is no power in any oil whatsoever. And, and James teaches that. Why? Because look at the very next phrase, in the name of the Lord. And so what James is saying is, listen, the elders of the church come, let him pray. But ultimately, the power for anything that happens is going to be in the Lord. The Lord is going to have to do something. And then we have verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. So we'll save, the idea is to free from disease. The sick is a different word even from the word used up in verse number 14. This word has the idea of being wearied, being fatigued, uh, and it can be from physical suffering or it can be from an illness that you have regardless of the source of the the difficulty that you're facing. uh, The result is that you are sick, that you're weary, that you're fatigued, that you are absolutely worn out, and the Lord will raise him up. The Lord will restore that person to health, whether it's physical or spiritual. What James is saying to believing church members who are suffering in some way, emotional, physical, spiritual, was simply this. You need to turn to God in prayer, regardless of the situation. Why? Because God deals compassionately with his people as they seek him. Do you see the compassion here? Whether you're suffering, you're sick, or it's a sin issue, what do we see? The sick, the Lord will raise up, the sins will be forgiven, and then in verse 16, confess and pray that you may be healed. Now, this text raises a lot of questions. A lot of people have taken this thing and run all over the place with it to try to push an agenda. You'll have faith healers, quote-unquote faith healers, who will take this passage and and say, see, it's right here. Uh, If if we just lay hands on you and you have faith, a miracle will happen in your life and you'll be healed. First of all, James doesn't say call for the faith healers. I don't want to, you know, it's... A little obvious, right? Call for who? The elders of the church. James doesn't call for a miracle. James calls for prayer. And that prayer will produce healing. We do believe that God alone heals according to his plan, do we not? We believe that. We don't believe that he does this through some faith healer. We don't believe that this is referring to the gift of healing, as some people think it's referring to. But we see a pattern laid out here. And the pattern is this. A complete and total trust in God for his will to be accomplished. We see that where? The prayer of faith. Now, what is the prayer of faith? A lot of people have tried to figure this out. I'll just simply refer you back to chapter 1, verse number 6. Because we we see this defined for us there. Chapter 1, verse 6, we've already seen it before but in in the past. But he's talking about praying, asking God for wisdom. And in verse 6, he says, let him ask how? In faith. What does that mean? With no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So this prayer of faith is essentially, I, I am fully confident in God. Fully confident that God will do whatever it is God chooses to do. I have no doubt about that. This is not 
a guarantee of physical healing for every sick person. Paul himself suffered from an ailment. He called it a thorn in the flesh. Three times he prayed that God would take it away. God never did. Why? Because it wasn't God's design. It wasn't God's will. It wasn't God's plan to take that away from Paul. He could have if he wanted to. And I'm sure that Paul prayed in faith. But God left it. We know situations and circumstances where people have prayed for others to be healed, and they were. They were made well. Some of you know my story, some of you don't. I'm not going to go into details, but I can tell you this. There is no reason medically that I should be alive today. There is no reason medically that I should be able to stand here, that I should be able to speak, that I should be able to think clearly, that I should be able to see, that I should be able to hear. Doctors told my parents he will not live through the night. And if he does, he'll never be the same. That's not funny. What? <laughs> I heard that. You're like, <laughs> what was he like before? Oh, you don't want to know. <laughs> Here's what I know. Medicine did not ultimately heal me. But God's people prayed. And God's plan for my life involved raising me up from that situation and healing me. But all of us know the other situation as well, where we have prayed, and we've prayed fervently, and we've prayed earnestly, and the physical healing that we so desperately wanted to come did not. Did God fail? No. Did we fail? No. It was God's plan, ultimately. You see, Christians have to have a right theology of life and death. And what I mean by that is that God determines the moment that we come into existence. That moment of conception was determined by God in ages past. But God also determines the, the number of our days. He determines the seconds that we have to live on this earth. And, and no medical technology and, and no prayer, nothing can change that. It's established by God. And so what we have faith in is God's absolute sovereignty and the perfection of his will. One commentator, and I'm going to read it in total, said, one thing the promises do not encourage or allow is that we should come into a place of prayer in a stubborn insistence that we've got it right. God, I know this is what you want to do. A place of stubborn insistence that our will must be done. In the prayer of faith, our faith is not that the promises will be fulfilled just like that, meaning the way we want it to be. It is the faith which rests trustfully in the will of a sovereign, faithful, and loving God. Neither the sick person nor any of the elders is there, any, is there to insist that his or her will be done. But to the sick one within the total eternal security of the unchangeable and unchangeably gracious will of God. And by the way, just another thing, a lot of times these faith healers will, will have people come up and, and they'll do their healing and somebody won't be healed and they'll say, um, well, you just didn't have the faith to be healed. Man, that's a damnable lie. Because right here it says the prayer of faith. Whose faith? Not the person who is sick, but the faith of the elders who pray for them. So if these faith healers were real, and they couldn't heal somebody, it's because their faith 
is insufficient, not the faith of the person looking to be healed. Just a little side note. Here's something else we need to realize too, because James addresses it. The last part of verse number 15, and if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Some people look at this and say, well, you know, uh, you're sick because you've sinned. Job, you've had all this stuff happen to you because you've sinned. All this terrible tragedy has come upon you because you've sinned. What sin have you committed, Job? Listen, not all sickness is the result of sin committed, but sometimes people do get sick because of sinful choices. Paul addressed that in 1 Corinthians 11 when he was talking about the people in Corinth who were partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy fashion, and many of them got sick and some of them died. The sickness was brought on because of the sin. David, in Psalm 32, before he confessed his sin with Bathsheba and repented of it, he says this, that, that while he was in that mode of trying to hide and cover up everything, his bones were like being crushed day and night. Why? Because he had sinned. He was suffering real physical ailments because of the sin. And so James is saying here, listen, not all sickness that someone endures is because of an actual sin committed. But if the sickness is the result of a sin, and those who confess that sin will be forgiven and they will be healed. In verse 16, James was concerned about the fellowship. All through this book, he's concerned about the fellowship and how it, can be, uh, how it can be healed through mutual confession and prayer. In other words, if you're sinning against one another, therefore confess your sins. All right, why? So that you don't get into this physical sickness and the spiritual sickness. Confess your sins to one another. If I sin against God privately, then you know what? I, I need to confess that sin to God privately. If I sin against you personally, then I need to confess that sin to you personally and seek uh, forgiveness from you and repent before you. If I sin before the entire church, then I need to confess that sin before the entire church and, and repent before you. And this is important to keep the body unified and whole and healthy. So I ask you, where do you go when you're exhausted, weak, and weary? Where do you turn when the load is more than you can bear? What do you do when you mess up, when you sin? So the good news is this, that if you are in Christ, you have someone to turn to. If you're a child of God, you've been given the right through faith in the Son to approach the Father. The righteousness of Christ has been imputed to you. It, is, it has been put into your account. And because the righteousness of Christ is in you, guess what? You have access to stand before the Father and boldly approach the throne of grace to find help in time of need. You have the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, you pray, James says here, as a righteous person. Not a perfect person, but a person who is the righteousness of Christ. And that prayer has great power as it works in and through your life. As I was thinking about this, I thought about the words to the, the song written so many years ago that many of us grew up singing. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything, every little thing, every big thing to God in prayer. Listen, God desires to display his great compassion, but then also God desires to display his great power. James here provides an illustration. The illustration, I think, is impactful. Why? Because Elijah was the perfect illustration in that we can relate to him. And, and James acknowledges that. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. 
Elijah was not in any way perfect. Elijah had all sorts of issues. If you know anything about the, the biblical prophet of Elijah, you can go back to 1 Kings chapter 17 and begin to read about him. And as you read in 1 Kings 17, you'll see that Elijah didn't have it all together. That Elijah had moments, yes, where he demonstrated great faith, but he also had moments where he was depressed and despairing. Elijah showed remarkable bravery at times and then obvious cowardice. Elijah was selfless and at times filled with self-pity. I, only I, have not bowed the knee. I, only I, am left alone. He had the Eeyore syndrome. 1 Kings 19, right? But James' point is this, that Elijah, being an ordinary man, yes, he was a prophet of God, and yes, he was used greatly of God, but an ordinary man, just like you and I, God used the prayers of Elijah to demonstrate his power to Israel. Have you ever heard someone say, well, the only thing I could do was pray? That's pretty close to the language James used to describe what Elijah did in this text. When it says he prayed fervently, the, the most literal translation of that is with prayer he prayed. With prayer he prayed. What does that mean? It means simply that Elijah did the only thing that he could do, and that was to pray. And when Elijah did what he could do, then God did what only God could do. He withheld the rain. And then when he prayed again, God caused the rain to fall and the land to heal and the earth bore fruit. And I think this is a powerful example that, that James gives because sometimes we get it in our head that we've got to be some sort of spiritual giant to pray effectively. We think that we've got to be eloquent. Have a robust vocabulary. Speak in King James English. And pray for hours on end to be heard. But Elijah just prayed. Matter of fact, if you go back to 1 Kings 17, don't, but write this down. If you go back to 1 Kings 17, we don't even know in that text why it stopped raining or why it started to rain. James actually, under the revelation of the Holy Spirit, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, reveals to us why it stopped raining and why it started raining again. Because Elijah prayed. So please listen to me, church. Your prayers don't need to be beautiful. They can be brief, right? They can be simple. Think about the, the prayer that the publican prayed outside the temple. What was it? How, how complicated was that prayer? Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus took note of it. Think about the prayer of the thief on the cross. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus heard it and acknowledged it. He said, you'll be with me in paradise. Your prayers don't need to be beautiful. They can be brief. They can be simple. They can be uncomplicated. But they must be sincere. And we have the assurance that God will hear them. Why? Because God desires to display his great power. And he responds to his people who pray. And so if we go back up to verse number 7, we have the command, be patient. We drop down to verse number 13. Let him pray. I want you to see something. That patience, while we're waiting... And prayer go hand in hand. One commentator wrote, and I thought it was great, prayer will minister to us in the experience which demands patience 
and patience will sustain us as we seek to engage the Lord in prayer. Listen, here's what James wants us to know. That God responds to the prayers of his people. And so we must continue praying as we wait. And my hope is that you will see how vital prayer is. And that prayer will become, if it is not already, a regular part of your life in Christ. Some people don't know how to pray. Well, listen, we have, we have a, people in our church who want to teach you how to pray. If, if that's where you're at, we have people. Ron and Sue Witt are going to be in January hosting a thing, teaching you how to pray. You want to learn how to pray? We'll teach you. But we must be a praying people. And we must go, watch God work as we pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Lord, I pray that you would work in every heart and life. Lord, I, I ask that you would help us to see the importance of prayer and that we would put this into practice daily. God, I ask that you would be glorified in and through us. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand. And Lord, I ask if there's one here today who's never put their faith and trust in you as Lord and Savior God, I, I pray that they would respond today by understanding and seeing their need for salvation, that they would turn to you in faith. Lord, that they would entrust their entire life to you. Lord, that they would repent of their sin and be saved. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I don't know anything about anybody's prayer life in this room except mine. I can tell you that, man, there are many times I struggle in prayer. I can tell you that, that I need this message, that I need this text. Because I, I need to pray more. I need to go to God more. But if you're in this room today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, listen, the, the, the thing that you need more than anything else is to have a relationship with God and that's only possible through faith in His Son. If you've never come to a place where you have called out to Jesus and you've, asked, you've not asked Him to save you, you've not put all of your hope and all of your trust in what He has done for you on the cross and in His resurrection, as soon as the service is over, I'll be down front. I would love to answer any questions that you have. I'd love to listen to you. I'd love to help in any way I can. So when we're done singing, when the announcements are finished, when we're dismissed, please come see me. Please give me the opportunity to have a conversation with you. Father, I ask that you would work, help us to respond to your word today in a way that glorifies you and honors you. And I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.